Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries monthly Lunch and Learn um, event today. My name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. We're based in Stonington, Maine on the coast. And our mission is to help sustain fishing and fishing communities in Eastern Maine and beyond. Um, today, we, we welcome a, a panel of experts talking about Atlantic salmon and the restoration of the wild Atlantic salmon fishery. I think you'll find it really interesting. Um, I wanna thank for a moment uh, our sponsors for today, including uh, Bar Harbor Banking and Trust, uh, the Camden National Bank, and the Island Fishermen's Wives Association from Stonington. Um, today, I'm pleased to welcome back Dwayne Shaw, who's going to lead the discussion here this afternoon. Dwayne is the Executive Director of the Downey Salmon Federation. Those of you who've joined this uh, series throughout the summer um, met Dwayne a couple of sec uh, segments ago where he was uh, a part of a panel talking about the Downey's Fisheries Partnership. And so I've worked with Duane for a number of years uh, at Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries and also in my past. And so our organizations are, are important founders of the Downey's Fisheries Partnership. But today we invited Duane to come back and dig a little bit deeper into the work that he does and has done very successfully around the Atlantic salmon. Uh, Duane's highly decorated, very well known in the Atlantic salmon world around the around the world. They're based in, um, in East Machias now, and he'll tell you more about their facilities uh, where they have a hatchery. In 2000, Duane was awarded uh, the National Coastal American Partnership Award from the President of the United States. And he's also was a recipient of a very prestigious Gulf of Maine Visionary Award back in 2016, recognizing his important work. Uh, Duane's joining us from his home in Franklin, Maine, and our other two panelists, are Joe Robbins and Topher Brown. Joe's uh, calling in from Winthrop where he lives. Uh, Joe's an avid sports fisherman, drone pilot, and has been active with DSF for a long time. Been on the board of directors for over 30 years. So uh, helped to uh, establish the board. He's probably predates Dwayne, I'm sure. Uh, so we'll learn, learn a little bit more about his past and how, how he's been participating both as a sportsman and as a, a leader in that organization. And then Topher Brown is, a, is also an avid sports fisherman, a guide, and an uh, author. He's got a, at least a couple of books we'll probably hear about today. One called Atlantic Salmon Magic. It came out in 2011 on uh, Wild River Press. And then another one called 100 Best Flies for Atlantic Salmon. We were just talking offline about uh, the, the art of fly tying. Uh, I suspect you'll hear more about that. Um, Topher is a registered professional guide and has guided uh, sports fishermen all over the United States and Canada. And um, he regularly writes for several fly fishing publications. So that's our panel for today. Uh, typical format here is that they have things to say that you wanna hear for the first say half hour, 45 minutes, and then we'll leave plenty of time at the end of our hour to uh, take your questions. I will um, be disappearing and between me and Tate Yoder, uh, we'll help to uh, uh, facilitate the Q&A session on this. I think we're gonna open up though with a video that Dwayne wanted you to see. And this is um, the source of their inspiration. It's a quick little, I think it's a minute or a little bit more of a, a video of a salmon run in uh, the River Tyne in England. So we'll let that go and then I'm gonna let you pick it up, Dwayne, okay? Okay, thanks, Paul. Well, thank, thank you, Paul, for putting that up and Tate. And the, um, 
the reason that I like to start with that is because that's that's what can happen to a, a dead river, a river that was declared essentially dead um, in the 60s on the River Tyne in England, in Eastern England, right near the Scottish border. And in what an inspiration that is, because it's this is uh, downtown Newcastle. Newcastle's an industrial city, uh, I think bigger than Bangor. So if you could picture that type of fish run, salmon run in Bangor or Augusta or Machias or any other place in Maine, um, we think that that's possible. We being the salmon conservation community who have worked so hard for so very long, but um, just to start, I wanted to thank thank uh, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries and its sponsors for hosting us. And as Paul said, this work is, um, fisheries restoration work is, is really complex and it requires a lot of different partners. And we're working closely, the Downey Salmon Federation through the Downey's Fisheries Partnership with Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. So we're taking a very comprehensive approach toward, toward fisheries recovery, which includes the wild Atlantic salmon, which is endangered, and Maine is the last place um, in the United States with uh, wild Atlantic salmon, and we're we're struggling to keep them and to recover them so that we can have exactly what you just saw on the River Tyne, a fishery um, and uh, an economy in recreational um, activities around this incredible fish, and. I'm joined by, as, as Paul said, um, Joe Robbins, who was a founding board member of the Downey Salmon Federation way back in the early 80s, as he likes to say, the last millennium. Um, and Topher, who's been involved deeply in the salmon world for decades himself and is a fly fishing instructor and, and deeply involved with the, the industry, if you will. And um, what what the Downey Salmon Federation is is doing is is really uh, bootstrapping our way toward restoration. So we're in we began in Washington County. We um, expanded our efforts into Hancock County, but the work that we're doing is is known um, well beyond that. And um, before we go into some of some of that, I just wanted to just briefly give you a snapshot of the life history of Atlantic salmon. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Joe to talk about some of the fishing history here and conservation um, history, grassroots conservation work. So the Atlantic salmon is a, is a really incredible fish. It's the king of freshwater game fish. It's known for its fighting abilities. It's um, phenomenal migratory pathways up into the Arctic and back down again to their home rivers and then um, up to often the very place that they were originally born to, to spawn and, and they um, will come back into Maine in the eight to 10, 12 pound range the first time they return. And a lot of people don't understand that Atlantic salmon don't die after they spawn. So they, they can repeat spawn. They can go back out to sea and come back again as, as a larger fish in 20 pound. And there have been fish up into the 50 pound range, certainly 40 plus pounds um, known in Maine over, over time. So they, uh, they spawn in fresh water and their, their young stay in fresh water for a couple of years, two and a half years roughly. They go to sea for two and a half years. So they're about five years old when they first return to spawn. And of course they need to get to their habitats that they need in the rivers to spawn. And we'll talk about some of the, the habitat work um, that we're doing afterwards. But Joe's gonna give us a little bit of a, um, a history of what the salmon fishing was like not that long ago, right here in this region. And uh, give it a go, Joe. Thank you. Uh, Dwayne's pretty good at this game. That's because 99% of what he knows he got from me. Uh, I want to show I want to show something to Carl Anderson. 
because I know he ties flies. These are all feather wing flies tied by the Hardy Company. And they, they're tied with extinct, exotic, and endangered bird feathers. And most of them are not tied anymore. And the people that do tie them get around four or $500 each for them. But uh, to get into the fishing part of it, uh, quickly, the, the rods most people use are eight or nine foot fly rods. They have a reel. Most of the rivers in Maine, people use a floating fly line, the sinking lines, but most people use a floating line with a weight forward taper. Uh, leaders, uh, monofilament leaders, anywhere from eight to 15 pounds. Uh, the flies are wet flies or dry flies. The ones I just showed you are all wet flies. So they go under the water, the dry flies stay on top. And the fun thing about watching people fish salmon with dry flies is most of them take the fly away and away from the fish when it shows, so they never get it. Uh, things we used for tailing or landing the fish were tailors that goes around the tail. It's a noose that goes around the tail or a gaff. They were made illegal years ago or, or a net. And the, the secret to landing a salmon with a net is you have whoever's netting the fish hold the net in the water and the fisherman puts the fish into the net. Otherwise, you'll see people chasing up and down the river with a net and they never get the fish or they lose the fish. So back in the days when they made, when they just made the gaff illegal, in Dennisville, everybody used a gaff. So when they made it illegal, somebody brought a net to Charlie's Rips and the first fish that got hooked, they had to net it. And it was a circus because the guy with the net chased it up and down, up and down, up and down. And they finally put the net down over the fish in the water so that in standing on the rim. So they still didn't have the fish. It was in the net, but they, they still had to get it to shore. And finally they did, but it was a fiasco. The uh, other things that most people will have for fishing down east is a, a vest to put all the gear in. Uh, clippers, nail clippers to clip the leader and clip flies off. And I, I have a story about clippers because I, I was fishing in Canada and I walked up the river about a mile and one of the local guys was fishing there and he was an old elder gentleman. And I said, how you doing? He said, I haven't uh, caught one this year. And I said, well, I, I've caught a few up here this week. Try this fly. And I gave him a fly and he held it in his hand. He just stared at it. And I said, are you going to put it on? He says, I forgot my teeth. <laughs> he didn't have any clippers and he couldn't bite the fly he had on off. So I had to put it on for him. And he did catch fish with it. Uh, the, if you go in the water and it's cold, you need either hip boots or chest waders. And back when I started, not many people had chest waders. Uh, the limits when I started fishing were in 1959 was two fish a day every day from April 1st to October 15th. And through the years that got changed to one fish a day every day from April 1st to October 15th. Then it changed to one fish a day then it changed to 10 fish a year, and then to five fish a year, then to no kill, and then finally to no fishing. And Canada may be heading that way soon if they don't take care of things like striped bass. Uh, there's a process when you have all the right gear then you have to learn how to catch these fish. They don't eat when they come in the river. So how do you make the fish eat or take the fly? 
My stepfather was Dr. Jim Payson. He said it's his analogy was, uh, if you can think back before we had re returnable bottles, if you're walking down the side of the road and you see a can, some people will kick it, some people won't kick it. And that was his analogy for salmon taking a fly. And I think it's true. Uh, and one of the things you had to do if you were just starting was go to the popular pools like the Mill Pool in East Machias or the Cable Pool in the Narraguegas or Charlie's Rips on the Denny's and watch the good fishermen. And you could learn that way and you could learn a lot. And back when I, when the fishing was really good, I never saw the morning news or the evening news. I was fishing and I would fish till dark. Uh, places that we fished, like on the Machias, were the, the Munson's Pitch, which was halfway between Machias and Whitneyville. And back in the 60s and 70s, there was a dam in Machias with a fishway and a dam in Whitneyville with a fishway. And they had a chalkboard on Main Street in Machias, uh, right in front of the old post office, that gave the number that went through the Machias trap and the number that went through the Whitneyville trap. So you could always tell how many fish were between the towns and whether it was worth going above Whitneyville to fish. Uh, so, Joe, could you, could you mention something about the way that the Salmon Federation gets started, Down East Salmon Federation? Oh, we had... Two Rivers Salmon Club, which was the Machias and East Machias Rivers, the Denny's River Club, and the Naraguega Salmon Club. And we all decided that it would be better if we joined forces and create a federation to represent the Down East Rivers. And we got together and we formed the Down East Salmon Federation. And look at it now. Nice. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. The funny thing about uh, salmon fishing is there were the popular pools like the mill pool in East Machias that was found after some uh, vandals opened the dam gates so that they weren't replaceable. So the dam was rendered useless and it was useless anyway, but uh, that opened up the mill pool. And that was the most popular pool on that river. And most people that fished, fished that pool. And I've, I always tell people when I die, I'm going to go to the lower regions because I fished the lower regions all my life. That's all the pools below the mill pool that nobody fished. And there were plenty of fish down there, but people were afraid to leave the mill pool, just like they're afraid to leave the cable pool on the Naraguegas. And this plenty of good pools below the cable pool and plenty of good pools above the cable pool. One year I had a course in May at the Academy in Cherryfield and there's a pool right there called the Academy pool. I caught two of the first three fish in the river that year, just cause I went over for that course and uh, people don't go down there to fish. They go all, they all go to the cable pool. Uh, what Joe, is it, is it possible that those vandals that, that altered the dam had any relate, connection to the fishery? <laughs> Do the bears go to the bathroom in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, along with all the learning to fish, uh, one of the basic things that I learned is and from my stepfather and books by Hewitt uh, is if you hold the rod vertically, you can land a 200 pound fish on four pound test. They can't break it. They can go around snags and break it. But uh, if you hold the rod vertically, it takes, it takes care of all the power. If you point the rod down at them, it increases the poundage that they can break and they do break it because you can take videos of fishermen 
with their rods pointing down and see the, the line snap back past them because it's broken leader. But if you hold the rod vertically, uh, you're not going to lose the fish. I don't care how big it is. And another thing about learning to fish, when it's windy or you screw up a cast, you're going to get overhand knots in your leader. Every one of the overhand knots reduces the poundage by half. So a lot of people that don't know that they have a knot in their leader and they lose the fish, they don't know why, it's because they had a knot in the leader. And you have to check it constantly. And the more you fish, the more you cast, you can learn and know by the cast whether you put a wind knot in your leader. So that's something you learn by doing. I've been doing okay. it 61 years now, so I've learned. You probably lost a few fish. Topher, have you, have you ever lost salmon while f salmon fishing? Uh, yeah, most definitely. Uh, you don't get them all, that's for sure. And uh, sometimes they don't, simply don't, you know, take the fly very well and the fly pulls out. Um, I would say the uh, breaking the leader, um, pretty rare for me these days, just because I, I tend to fish a fairly strong leader so I can land fish quickly. So they'll be in good shape when I release them. And uh, so more often than not, it's the fly just pulling out and you get your fly back and uh, the fish gets away. And uh, there's, a, there's a saying in, in fly fishing and in salmon fishing called the tug is the drug. And the tug that you get when a fish takes your fly is what you're really fishing for. And, and I would agree with that. You know, it's uh, that initial sensation that you get when you're connected to a salmon is uh, the highlight of fishing for salmon beyond just, you know, being there and being on a salmon river is a wonderful experience. But that, that initial hookup is what we fish for. And the playing of the fish is, um, I think, of secondary importance and the, uh, in terms of the enjoyment. But it's become increasingly uh, important to make sure that you land your fish quickly. And so that they're in good shape, they don't build up lactic acid in, in the, uh, the bloodstream of the fish, uh, much like you know, a person exercising would get tired. And so if we're gonna land a fish, then we're very careful now to make sure that we photograph it in the water, hopefully. And, um, and there's, a, there's a good general rule now on the salmon rivers of Canada that if you, you want to land a fish in about 30 seconds to the pound. So if it's a 10 pound fish, you, know, you should really get it in in no more than five minutes. And if you know what you're doing, you can do it even quicker than that. And so I had a 16 pound fish um, three days ago in Canada, I'm just back from Canada. And, and I landed that fish in four and a half minutes. And so put the pressure on it, like uh, Joe describes. And, uh, um, and when they uh, are in your hands, you remove a barbless single hook, which comes out very easily and you let them go. You want them to take off like a jet engine leaving the launching pad and uh, which is a good indication that they're in, in good shape. And so it's a uh, catch and release mortality. They're, they're about to, to start a new big uh, study on catch and release mortality on the mirror machine. But two previous uh, studies have indicated that survival rates for catching and releasing a salmon by fly fishing are in the 99% range, meaning if you release 100 fish, 99% of them survive without any issues. And the only caveat to that would be is if, if it's very warm water, uh, it's a cold water fish. So if you release them in very warm water, their survival rates go down. And now on the Miramichi, they have something called, uh, Miramichi is a large river uh, just north of Maine in New Brunswick, which flows due north and into Miramichi Bay. And they now have what are called warm water 
protocols. So when the temperature of the river reaches a certain level, which is generally about 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, they close the fishing. And the idea being that, yes, you could probably catch a salmon in those uh, temperatures, but they wouldn't be in particularly good shape if you let them go. And uh, catch and release is mandatory on the mirror machine. You have to let them go. And so it's a, it's a question of ethics. Um, how do we um, love a resource, get the fish to come back, um, enjoy our connection to the fish through fishing, but not have any um, deleterious effects on the survival of the fish um, so that um, sport fishing is not part of the problem, but it's rather part of the solution. And if we don't fish for them, I think the, uh, there will be fewer friends for salmon rivers and for salmon. So the fact that we've lost a lot of fisheries here in Maine, I think has reduced the interest in salmon fishing in Maine. And uh, so it's important that anglers like Joe and Dwayne really describe what a vital part of Maine, of Maine fishing history, the Atlantic salmon fishery was between, oh, the days of the uh, Bangor salmon pool in the 1920s, right up through the, uh, the early 1980s and even the late 80s. Um, I, I caught a salmon on the Penobscot in about 1989 and, um, you know, and they're still there. Uh, last year's run of fish was quite healthy. Um, 2,500 or so, I think it was, Dwayne, last year. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, you know, we still have them. They are an iconic species. And they are only in the state of Maine in the entire United States of America. And... Um, and because they were such a vital part of Down East history and the community of the, of the, of the fisheries there, um, that's why we feel it would be wonderful to restore them to, uh, to their previous, uh, to restore the rivers to their previous state of health. Mm -hmm. I, I could thank you, Topher and Joe. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the conservation and, and our work to turn this around such that Someday again, we will be fishing for these fish. And um, when I moved to Machias in 81, a lot of people were fishing the rivers. I was there to study as a fisheries biologist. You made Machias, and I remember seeing Joe down at the bottom of uh, College Hill, down at the river, fishing right there above the bridge on, uh, on Route 1. And you could walk from campus right down and and fish right at the bottom of, of the hill. And of course, there was a lot of activity in Whitneyville and, and as Joe said, Denny'sville and East Machias, and Cherryfield and, and upriver areas as well. And people were vacationing here specifically to salmon fish. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to work for the state for the Salmon Commission, which is the only single species commission, I believe that has ever been staffed in the state of Maine. Um, the Salmon Commission is now part of Maine DMR, um, Bureau of Ceron Fisheries and Habitat. And the Downey Salmon Federation got started by anglers um, trying to, to work for their home rivers, their communities to recover the fish, protect the fish, protect the watersheds. And in what Joe describes as, you know, we've come a long way, baby, from the early 80s, as far as Downing Salmon Federation goes, we've now got um, a dozen staff, full-time staff, about eight trained biologists. We've got, we have two hatcheries, and those hatcheries are, are really experimental conservation hatcheries. These are new, these aren't your grandfather's hatcheries, so to speak. These are experiments, and they're producing really tremendous results, and we seriously need um, innovation in this because all of the work for well over a hundred years here has has not really done the job and that's for a lot of reasons and um, but the work that we've done in East Machias which was mimicked after styled after what was accomplished on the River Tyne in England 
So the video that we, we saw of all those fish jumping up over that small dam in downtown Newcastle is the inspiration for what we believe could, could happen here and elsewhere. So it was a, a naturalized style of raising the fish. So we've learned a lot about genetics back in the 80s, even we, we were still making a load of mistakes in terms of mixing stocks of fish. Today, we have a much better handle on, on the genetics of these fish. And, and as such, they're being managed individually stock by stock. So there's a, a designated um, uh, stock for the Denny's, the East Machias, the Naraguegas, the, uh, the Machias itself, uh, the Pleasant, and then the Penobscot, the Sheepscot, and um, there and the uh, now the Kennebec will have its own strain in time as well. So and there are many many vacant habitats in in the state. So just not far from where I'm sitting, the Union River is a river watershed, 500 square mile drainage area, the size of the Machias River watershed, but it has a dam at the head of tide that was built in 1907 back when people used to say, there's a lot of fish in the sea. We don't have to worry about this one small river because there are other fish elsewhere. Well, we know now that there aren't a lot of fish in the sea anymore and we dang better get our stuff together and, and really put, um, as one of our major supporters says, the pedal to the metal. We are up against the wall with, not only Atlantic salmon, but other species. And we need innovation and we need to be uh, you know, really aggressive about this. So our local organization has um, created a, a number of programs that we, you know, I think of it as a complete wrap around what we're doing things that the agencies aren't capable of doing themselves that are, or actually have the full jurisdiction to uh, manage the fish, the full, ultimate responsibility, but as anglers, we have a responsibility as community members, conservationists. So we created these hatcheries. We've created a land trust program uh, solely focused on protecting the river corridors, the shady areas along the streams that are so important for river temperature. We're doing um, monitoring, advocacy work. We're looking at the ecosystem, and this is another sort of piece of this is do we truly understand the interrelationship between say the sea run smelt or the sea run alewives and their connection to atlantic salmon and vice versa so when an when an atlantic salmon comes up into the river as joe said it doesn't it doesn't feed when it comes into the river it sits and waits for spawning season then it spawns and it drops back out to sea, either that fall after spawning or the next spring, it will sit in the river all winter long, largely not feeding, um, and then head out to sea just at the time that the sea run smelts are coming in to spawn. And their first big meal when they leave the rivers are smelt. And, and similarly, they will eat alewives, young alewives, um, the young salmon will eat young alewives. So of course there's this interconnectedness between all of these, these things that co-evolve together. But there's, there's some pieces to this that um, the person that we worked with from, from England named Peter Gray, he had said, you really, you know, part of what we're doing with these conservation hatcheries is these are life support systems. We wanna be out of the hatchery business as soon as possible. But in order to do that, it's a numbers game. We have to have a critical mass of fish. There are schooling fish. They leave the rivers in schools. They get out past the predators as a result of abundance. And so we, it's a numbers game, but it's also quality. So the quality of the fish coming out of the hatcheries was a key piece that we focused in on in the results of 10 years of experimentation is now shown and, and all of our agency partners are, um, are singing off of the same sort of scientific music sheet now saying, yes, this approach that you adopted from the time is proving much superior 
um, to the fry stocking methods and the smolt stocking methods that we've been using for decades upon decades. So as a result, we've, um, we're building out our hatchery on the Pleasant River in the years to come as a par hatchery. So not fry, not the tiny little guys, but the, the uh, fingerlings survive much, much better, especially if they're raised in the river of origin with the river water completely um, unfiltered. So they're subjected to all the stresses of, that you, they would see once they're released. So when you put all of these components together, we're seeing up to 14 times their return rate compared with small stocking. So the Penobscot River with its 2000 fish return could potentially have been up in the 20,000 range if we were putting out the quality smolts that could originate if you use PAR for stocking. So those are the types of innovations that are, are have not been um, handled particularly well in the United States or in, in many other places. And we think that we're, what we're finding here will help perhaps New Brunswick in the future or, or other places. And we get the question all the time, well, are there any success stories? And if you look at Norway, um, there's this really tremendous success stories of turning fisheries, salmon fisheries around there. Um, Denmark and, and now in Nova Scotia, using methods found, tested elsewhere, and then applied um, sort of comprehensively. Um, so we, we're, uh, we're always uh, sort of making the argument that you can't throw in the towel yet. This is, this is the presidential fish is another um, part of the history here in Maine. The first salmon caught on the Penobscot was always was sent to the president of the United States and it became a ceremony that helped to support um, the ongoing efforts to recover the fish. And very important, of course, to the, to the Native Americans um, and, and really worldwide where sa Atlantic salmon exists, the, the connection to those fish goes back way, way into the history in Ireland and there's Norway and France and so many other places. So um, the game's not over. I guess that's the, uh, that's what I want to get across is there's innovation here. The news that you read, I hope you see the stories of success and, and struggle the struggle to get fish passage into the Union River Dam built in 07 that still doesn't have uh, fish passage and it doesn't have downstream fish passage either. So fish are getting ground up. They're getting trapped and trucked at the bottom of a dam, trucked 12 plus miles upstream. And, and when they come downstream, say the river herring, we've documented and the eels and other things getting chopped up. In the, in the dams. So there are many, many pieces of um, recovery actions that we're, we're trying to put into place on the Kennebec. There's a lot of debate over those dams. And, and this isn't new. These, there were struggles in 07 on the Union River to make sure that fishways got built. They, lost, they didn't win that, those people that were advocating for it. In the the very first dams built on this continent. There was immediate controversy and I think it was 1607 in Cape Cod that you would by law have to have a fishway in a dam. And, and those laws got um, watered down over time because of the industrial era. Well, now things are turning around and, and we're, we're using water power in other ways, there's innovation around uh, fish-friendly hydro and so on. So I, I don't want to, um, I want to encourage people to look at our website, the Downey Salmon Federation, come and visit our facilities, get in touch with us, learn about what we're doing. There are groups all over Maine doing um, this type of work, whether you're in the St. John 
watershed, the St. Croix watershed, where St. Croix, the, the native salmon run was extinct, but just like the native run on the Union had gone extinct because of dams, but we can repopulate these areas, these rivers using these modern genetics and culture techniques and bring those, turn that around. Of course, once we address fish passage and water quality. Um, we said that we would leave at least 15 minutes for some questions and um, I think we're right about at that time. I think. Wayne, I can fix those glasses for a small fee. <laughs> Well, I was at a meeting last night and left my glasses, a, a meeting about a dam in Whiting, and uh, walked away without my good glasses. So I've got to, you got an extra bow for me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne and Topher yeah. and Joe. Very interesting stuff. And uh, folks who, who are here attending, I hope you've enjoyed this so far. We do have about 15 minutes left for some questions, you can uh, raise your hand or uh, use the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen or the chat function to ask a question if you like. Um, and while those come in, Dwayne, I'll, I'll get started with one. You, as you know, we do a lot of work in the Gulf of Maine and looking at how commercial fisheries of various um, uh, species are you know, both struggling and we have our own goals around restoring them. And we're becoming more and more aware of the, the bigger changes going on in the Atlantic Ocean and really ecosystem change that's out there in the blue water and on, on into the Gulf of Maine and whether that's physical features like temperature and you know um, storms and freshwater influence or other biological features. Um, I don't know if you can comment or, or what you know is going on with studying the impact of those <clears throat> kinds of big system changes on the Atlantic salmon. Yeah, they're, the Atlantic salmon's most, one of the most well-studied fish, probably, uh, certainly in the Atlantic. And there's been a lot of examination in, on, you know, in Europe, as well as here on this continent, and looking for sort of the critical points where we're losing fish at sea, or the influences, and then sort of modeling what may happen with the climate predictions in part of what was found, and this was um, an interesting result of a lot of research was that the prey base that, the, that they seek to find when they go to the Arctic is actually there, but had, had moved. And, and it appeared that the salmon weren't really finding their prey, even though they exist, they ex exist there in, relative abundance. So this, the, with the tagging technology now, we're learning a lot about these fish. So while they've been studied and they've been tagged and we're using um, sort of physical tags, now with some of the new technology, we're, it, they're sending direct to satellites in some, in some cases, information in real time about where these fish are being lost or intercepted in, in other fisheries. And one interesting thing that I we learned about not too long ago is that quite a few of the salmon from um, the Bay of Fundy and the Gulf of Maine, as they exit the Gulf of Maine, they go out around the tip of Nova Scotia and they were, were losing quite a few fish there. And these, these tagging uh, these tags will give you temperature as well, so you know where, where in the water column they are. The temperatures were going way up, higher than apparently the water temperature itself, and they realized that a lot of the salmon were being picked up in, by poor beagle sharks, which regulate their body temperature. Huh. So on the West Coast, they're called salmon sharks. Here, they're called poor beagles, and they feed on salmon, and they're fairly abundant at the time at this time so there are just so many so many things happening at once we're learning a lot the, the models are telling us of course temperatures are are shifting but one one thing that we often refer back to is not that long ago 
a couple of hundred years ago, the Connecticut River was just teeming with Atlantic salmon at a much lower latitude in, in conditions that are, are, were very warm at that time. So we're not at the southern extent of the salmon um, historically here. So we feel like with the groundwater resources we have, we have tremendous groundwater in Maine. And then with these, these uh, coastal currents, as you know, the Downey's yeah. Coastal Current, um, it's the coldest water on the eastern seaboard in terms of the Atlantic. So um, time will tell what yeah. is at salinity's wind direction, uh, rain frequency and abundance. And these things are, are shifting, but these fish are tough and they evolve and they, they, many of the species, of course, that we're seeing move northward um, uh, are so, moving as a result of that. But there are also, there are some species that are evolving real time with the changes that are happening. So that's, that's a big question is, is how quickly the fish can evolve to keep pace with some of the changes that we know are happening. Thanks, Dwayne. We have uh, several questions in the queue here, and I'm going to try to get through as many as we can. Um, Peter Sly, who's a friend of the organization, uh, writes in about a story of a, a restoration project in the Penobscot River, and um, a dam was identified for target targeted removal, but the dam and dam, dam owner agreed, but didn't foot the bill. So the concept was was open to the nurseries and the Piscataquis for ocean salmon. Given that recoveries haven't met expectations, what should be done now, where, and who should have the lead and pay for removals? Well, I one thing I will say um, is that on the East Coast, we've not held um, the hydro industry feet to the fire like they've done on the West Coast. So if you look at the the who will pay or who should pay. Um, I think that these uh, those that are using the river for private gain should be paying more. That's that's my answer to this. Okay. Um, yeah. There's a couple of questions. One in the chat and one here in the Q and A that that are asking about um, the. Your thoughts on salmon aquaculture farms and their impact potentially on the wild salmon recovery? Yes, I and Topher, you've certainly been involved with this, and, and Joe has too. But um, generally, Atlantic salmon net pen aquaculture has been one of the biggest um, threats to wild salmon. It's been identified by the scientific community for quite some time um, as such, and the regulations are not keeping pace with the, with the issue. Uh, Maine has only as the result of lawsuits um, curtailed some of the activity, but it remains a very significant problem. And Topher, perhaps you'd like to talk about some of the things you've observed or been aware of. You bet. Um, I think one of the, um, the real issues for putting aquaculture at the mouth of Salmon River is the real difficulty is that when the wild fish, when the juveniles head out to sea, they can pick up sea lice, which is a parasite, uh, normal normally found in salt water, but because aquaculture fish in pens are closely gathered and grouped together, there's a proliferation of sea lice. And if a juvenile wild Atlantic salmon comes out of a salmon river, if it picks up nine to 11 of these small, their blood sucking parasites, it will kill the fish. So locating aquaculture in the ocean within a certain number of miles, call it 10 miles in either direction, or certainly along the migratory pathway, is uh, something that we know kills wild fish. The other issue with open net, pen net pens is they have a lot of escapes. 
And so the, the aquaculture fish in a big storm, the net may break and they will attempt to swim up salmon rivers and interbreed with wild fish. And one of the things that we know now is that the information for wild fish as to where they go to feed in the North Atlantic is passed on genetically. So if you have two wild parents, there's a genetic code that, that enables them to find the feeding grounds off of Northern Newfoundland and the West Coast of Greenland. And it's very similar to the homing instinct that the monarch butterfly has to find its locations for wintering in Mexico or birds uh, for finding a specific location. And we used to think that adult salmon led young salmon to where they needed to feed, but uh, the, there's been several elegant studies which have looked at juvenile fish that have migrated to specific locations with no input other than the genetic coding that's passed on. Why all this background? Just to know that if you take a hatchery fish, you know, which is a um, I'm calling it a hatchery fish, but an aquaculture fish that may be from Norway because it grows quickly and you put it into main waters and then you have an escape and that fish goes and interbreeds with a wild fish from uh, the Machias River, then that genetic information, which has been in place since essentially the last ice age becomes scrambled and you have an inferior fish swimming out into the ocean that is not only less able to survive, but less able to find feeding grounds, which have been passed on for thousands of years genetically. Thank you. Um, very complex issue, that one there. Uh, let's see, Timothy Shaw wants to share some good news. He he's, lives over along the Duck Trap River off of Penobscot Bay. And for the first time in several years, he's seen salmon par this week. Mm -hmm. So he attributes that to good water conditions this year, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. There's, uh, I think we, we, we answered um, Roy, essentially climate change impact on habitat. There was a couple of folks asking about um, really the, the, the role of, he, of our intervention and restoration activities versus opening the dams and, and uh, letting nature take its course. What would happen? Would, would we get you know, recovery just simply by removing barriers um, or has it gotta be supplemented with what you're doing? That, that's a really good question. And, and in Maine, unfortunately, or the United States, unfortunately, we're not going to see um, recolonization from any nearby strays coming in. So on the River Tyne, part of the, the question was there, was it the hatchery that drove the recovery? Was it the remnant population of, of existing fish? Or was it strays coming in as they migrated on their way towards Scotland up along the coast? And there wasn't enough data to necessarily conclude one direction or the other. There, um, because the fish from the hatchery were not marked. So as a result, it left hanging this, this question. Here, we don't, we don't have that question because there, there is no robust population that will just re-inhabit this by straying in from Newfoundland or, or Labrador. Um, so we are in the unfortunate circumstance where we are dependent upon supplementation using this live gene bank approach, which has been done successfully elsewhere. In Norway, for instance, they had to remove the genetic um, components or remove some fish, hold them like what we're doing. And they, they had to eradicate a uh, non-native parasite in the river. And then they put the fish back in again and they're, they're now fishing those rivers again. So the model of a live gene bank supplementation is, is, can, can work. It has worked elsewhere and it's our only option, unfortunately. It's, and, and it is the biggest constraint on recovery at, the, at this point in time. So we have a lot of good habitat that's been open 
for a long time and the stocking methods so there hasn't been the the numbers of fish available to stock those areas and the quality of the fish that were being put in there um, just didn't lead to high survival rates so that's that's one of the biggest limits we have the Craigbrook National Fish Hatchery and the Green Lake National Fish Hatchery are the two um, available um, facilities and, and they're way undersized for the task at hand. That's why the Downey Salmon Federation constructed hatcheries to, to add to that capacity. And we need to do more of that, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, Dwayne. I'll just point out folks should have seen Sebastian Bell's comment in the chat in response to the earlier question. And that was my understanding too, that um, we, Maine does try to limit the, the genetic stocks to, um, to local strains um, and that our aquaculture industry does have a containment management systems, whether they're bulletproof or not, I don't know, but we don't need to debate that right now. But that part of the industry is aware of these issues and concerns. Uh, Pam Pearson has talked. Has... I, I will say that the reason we have those, those regulations in place is because lawsuits were filed to force those into place. Those were not put in place by the state of Maine itself or the industry voluntarily. Um, a judge did that. Thank you for our legal system. And thank you for our, our advocates and activists out there who support our work to as watchdogs over this and other industries. Understood. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, try to get a few more in here before we wrap up. Pam Pearson weighed in with a couple of comments and one asking if you work with the Craig Brook uh, National Fish Hatchery in Orland. We certainly do. We're completely um, interwoven with, with their their work and they maintain the and do a tremendous job of doing this with very limited resources. They may maintain the uh, essentially the live gene bank there and they have limited capacity to actually produce numbers of fish to go out into the rivers. So we work um, to build that capacity alongside them. Um, thanks. What's the impact, Roy wants to know, what's the impact of uh, commercial fishing of Atlantic salmon off of Greenland? and the potential of trying to limit that. Mm. I can speak so, to that. So you've been involved with that one yeah. quite a bit. Um, currently there's an agreement in place with uh, KNAPK, which is the Greenland Fishers and Hunters uh, organization that manages uh, the fishery for Atlantic salmon. There's an agreement in place between the Atlantic Salmon Federation and the North Atlantic Salmon Fund based out of uh, Iceland to uh, limit their commercial catch to 20 metric tons of, of fish. The, these are Atlantic salmon. These are all large Atlantic salmon, the, what we would call a multi-sea winter fish. Those are the only ones that migrate down the, uh, the west coast of Greenland right about this time of the year, August and September. The issue with the, um, the agreement has been one of counting and uh, because you're, you're dealing with uh, uh, Inuit communities, uh, First Nations communities on the west coast of Greenland, getting them all to report on their catches in nets in a timely fashion is difficult. And it's, it's, I don't think there's internet in a lot of these communities. So it, it's, it's very difficult to know that you've hit your 20 metric tons and, and whether or not there are still nets in the ocean. So for the last couple of years, anyway, they have exceeded their quota and by factors of two, um, two and a half. So they, they've gone way over their quota. I don't think they're doing it uh, intentionally, uh, but again, it's, it's an issue of the integrity of the counting system. And there's also a difficulty in that um, the majority of these fish are um, of North American origin. So they're taking some of the largest spawners in these nets. 
It's a relatively new fishery that uh, has probably been going on for 40 or 50 years only. And uh, the other issue is um, there's still a lot of recreational catch and kill in Eastern Canada. And that's by fly fishermen. Um, it is also First Nations fisheries. And there are a few small interceptory fisheries on the coast of Newfoundland, uh, sorry, the coast of Labrador. And so if you add up all of that in Eastern Canada, uh, between fly fishermen killing fish, where, where it is legal to do so, the provinces that allow that are Newfoundland, Labrador, and Quebec, and First Nations fisheries, and what remains of small commercial fisheries on the coast of Labrador, uh, those numbers exceed the numbers of fish that are being killed in Greenland. And so I think you can make a pretty strong case that um, one way forward would be to clean up our own act as fishermen and to stop killing fish recreationally. And because I think there's less um, impetus for the Greenlanders to be careful about their count when they know that North Americans are killing more fish than they are. And so in order to sort of take the high ground and get them to uh, limit their catch, I think we have to ask the same thing of ourselves to limit our catch. And we need to catch, to catch and kill way less fish than we do. And it's not simply a situation where, where we're asking other people to, uh, to kill fish or not to kill fish, but we're, um, we're not giving them any, uh, um, any moral, you know, we're, we're on the, we're not on the high ground. And if, if they stop killing them, they simply look at us and go, well, <clears throat> if we let them go, then you, you guys are going to kill them. And uh, that is, that's kind of where we're at right now. I think that, yeah, thanks Topher. That's a good summary of that. And one additional element I think is that the Greenlanders point at us and they say, well, you guys produce the babies, we produce the adults, you're not producing enough babies, look at the way you're treating your rivers. So the Union River, as an example, the Kennebec, the Penobscot, and on and on, the St. Croix, completely, you know, in some cases, depaupered of, of any juvenile salmon headed to Greenland. So there have to be babies to produce the adults, and, and we're all obviously connected. So. Well, as, a, as usual here on our Lunch and Learns, we've um, we run out of time and we got to most of our questions, but I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, Dwayne, Topher, and Joe for spending the hour with us, sharing your knowledge and, and experience. And I want to thank everybody that attended today, uh, the session. Again, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Bar Harbor Bank and Trust, Camden National Bank, and the the Island Fish, Fishermen's Wives Association from Stonington. Uh, my name is Paul Anderson. I'm the executive director at MCCF. Our contact information is right there on the screen. We do these once a month and I anticipate one more this season before we break for the winter. So at the end of October, keep, keep your ear to the ground and we'll um, hopefully bring up another important uh, issue to, uh, to have a discussion with experts like we've had today. Again, thank you for attending. This session will be is recorded and will be packaged and processed and put on our website in the next couple of weeks. And uh, you can um, expect to review it or share it with friends that way if you'd like to. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thank you, Thanks, Paul. Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, hey. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.